Juneteenth celebration last week was amazing, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that a little later on in the message, but we had a great time. Very difficult to get a, a, a precise count because folks come in and they leave and they go, and we don't have a single entry point for the event. We're estimating like between 350 and 450 people came by for the event, which was incredible. Um, the food was great, uh, you know, uh, in the the. the just connection with folks in the community and among the church. It was just really, really good. Like I said, you're going to talk a little bit more about that later. If we haven't met yet, my name's Scott Blevins. I'm part of the pastoral teaching team here with Garfield Memorial Church. Uh, I am not Chip Freed, who was scheduled to preach today, but he's a little under the weather, so he called this morning and see, to ask if I could step in. I said, sure, no problem. Um, he's got a great message prepared as well. You're going to hear that. I don't know whether it'll be next week or the week after, but, uh, but you'll hear that word from Chip. But you've got me today, and uh, I just want to take a moment and say, God, thank you for your presence here. Um, uh, we have sung our praises to you. We have prayed to you. Now, Lord, we are going to listen to you. Help us hear what you have to say to us today. Um, Lord, let everything that I say that is not of you be quickly forgotten. May those things which are of you take root in us and grow and bear fruit for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, all right. So, we're continuing in our series, Wise Cracks, uh, and the theme verse for this series is we've been looking at wisdom in the book of Proverbs and other places. I, I just got to say, we call, you know, uh, scholars, whoever those folks are, call certain passages of the Bible, certain books of the Bible, wisdom literature, uh, Psalms, Job, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, uh, uh, you know, those books. Bible's got wisdom in other places too. Don't tell the scholars that. It'll confuse them. But, uh, but this is wisdom literature, and we're looking for some wisdom. Uh, the theme verse for this series has been, though it costs you all, I'm sorry, get wisdom, get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. We need, we need some wisdom, and we need some understanding in our lives, in our church, in, well, God's church, in this world that we live in, our country, in our communities. We need wisdom. We need understanding. We need it so much right now. It seems like that, that every week and sometimes multiple times a week, there are just these massively disruptive things that are happening, things that cause all sorts of confusion and distress and, and, and disruption in our lives, in our community, in our country, in our culture. And, and the reality is, is we've had another one of those weeks this past week. And, and I, 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 you know, it's been another tough week for a church that is multi-ethnic, economically diverse, and politically diverse like Garfield is. And, and I don't know where each individual here stands or sits or how you feel about the decision the Supreme Court made this past week, um, but knowing our church, I'm, I'm like 99.99% sure we've got some folks today that are celebrating and we've got some folks today that are outraged. Let's point out two things. One is we're together worshiping God together, wherever we stand on that particular issue. And I also have to say this, that that decision is going to have real practical impact on the lives of a lot of women, girls, and children. And, and women and girls that are involved in crisis pregnancies need so much more than our celebrations and our outrage. Um, that, none of that will help them. What they need is a community to surround them with love, with care, with financial support, with emotional support, with, super, with spiritual support, with, uh, with mental health support, all of those things. Let's be that together. And, 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 and do with whatever you need to do with your celebration and your outrage. But let's be that community together for the folks around us and around this country. Um, that's not what I'm preaching about today. I just needed to say that, okay? Um, what I'm preaching about today is disruption. So maybe that is what I'm preaching about today. I don't know. Um, disruption and refuge. Disruption and refuge. There is a theme that we see, a lot of themes repeat throughout Scripture. One of them is the notion that God is our refuge. 
You can read it a lot. You read it in Proverbs. You read it a lot in the Psalms and also in other parts of Scripture. I'm going to read two verses that Terry didn't read. They're each verses from Psalms, but they have to do with this notion of God being our refuge. Hear this. One is a real familiar verse if you've been part of the church for any length of time. If you're, if you're new to this stuff and this is a new verse, you might find some strength and comfort in this over the years. Psalm 46.1, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And Psalm 91.2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. God is our refuge and our strength. If, if we believe that, and I think we should, I think that there's so much hope, there's so much comfort in that, there's so much strength in that. We have to believe this as well. If we need a refuge, then we need, there is something out there from which we need refuge. Do you hear that? That if we hear the Bible repeatedly, and the Bible was written over the course of hundreds of years, and if over hundreds of years, different writer after different writer after different writer keeps talking about needing God as our refuge, we can expect that there's always going to be something that we need refuge from. There's always going to be some distress. There's always going to be disruption. We are not going to escape the reality of that in this life. The hope that we have is not a life free from disruption. On the contrary, we need the, some of the disruption we need. The hope is not a life free from disruption. The hope is that God is our refuge when there's disruption going all around us. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? The passage, the verse that Terry read from Proverbs, echoes this same theme. Proverbs 14, 26 says, boom, in the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. We're going to stop right there for a minute. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. Now, first of all, let's talk about that word fear. Because there's a lot of misunderstanding about what that means when the Bible, and the Bible talks a lot about the fear of the Lord, fear God, fear the Lord, all of this kind of stuff, over and over and over and over and over again. And, and, and one of the things that fearing the Lord means is fear, just like we think of fear. And I've heard a lot of pastors over the years say, it doesn't mean we should be afraid of God. Yeah, it does. It, it does. When we get in the way of what God is doing, we ought to be afraid of God, all right? And, and that, that, that's not, it's not a joke. It's not, it's not silly. It's not, it, it's not ridiculous or cartoonish. But God's got a plan for this world. And God's got a plan for us, a vision, a future that God has prepared for us and that God is moving us toward and moving the world toward and the culture toward. And if we get in the way of that, we will be suffering. We will be in pain. We will be hurt. And we should fear that. Jesus himself said, I am the rock, the cornerstone, the chief stone, the foundation of the building. I'm the cornerstone. And, and, and if this rock falls on you, you will be crushed. If you fall on the rock, you will be broken to pieces. If, you know, if we get in the way of the rock, we're going to get rolled over. Okay? And we need to understand that. But, but our God is not a tyrant. God is not a petulant child. God is not an arrogant CEO out going, well, you annoyed me, so now I'm going to make you suffer. That's not who God is at all. And that's why we need the greater part of the understanding of the fear of the Lord is really a sense of reverential awe. That God is so much greater so much more wonderful, so much beyond our understanding that when we encounter God, we just have to go, oh my God, I can't believe it. If you can imagine the person you admire and respect and, and, and hold in the highest degree of all, the human being, whoever that is, whether they're someone close to you or a distant person that you've never, imagine them showing up to your house you know, at 7 a.m. on Saturday morning while you're still in your bathrobe and your fuzzy slippers, and how you're going to respond to them. Huh? Don't, you know, I got to wait. Huh? You know, you want bacon, you want coffee, you want orange. What? How are you going to respond to that? How are you going to feel? That sense of reverential awe. Now multiply that by a factor of a thousand. 
And you have a sense of the kind of reverential awe that the scripture keeps calling us to when it says fear the Lord. Folks that we hold in reverential awe, we pattern our lives after them. We'll look at them and see how they're dressed and we'll say, ooh, you know, I need to look more like that or I definitely can't look like this other thing because they, you know, they, they, we, we'll, we'll model how to vote after them. We'll model how to live and how to act and how to talk and what songs we sing. Uh, all of these things. When we hold someone in reverential awe, they have the power to shape our lives. And that's what the fear of the Lord is. It is a piece of, I don't want to get in God's way because I'm going to get crushed. But the larger part is this sense of, I hold God in such reverential awe that I'm going to allow what God is doing, what God thinks, what God's plan is, who God is, that's going to shape my life. That's who I'm going to model my life after. In the fear of the Lord... And the, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being disruptive to our tech people back there because we, we, we both were on last minute notice today on this one. Um, the fear of the Lord, I want to go back to that scripture. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. So I'm going to skip the Lord. I'm continuing to disrupt our tech people. And I'm going to jump to confidence, okay? And then we'll come back to the Lord. I'm going to jump to confidence because the confidence there means, I love this, in the word, the Hebrew word that we translate as confidence, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it because I'm terrible at that. It means this. I missed it. I just lost my blank. There it is. Clinging onto someone or something else for support or safety. Clinging onto someone or something else for support or safety. Our confidence is not in ourselves. I know you've had folks tell you, you need to be more self-confident, or maybe you have. No one has ever told me that. <laughs> People usually tell me, Scott, tone it down a bit, you know, all right? Yeah, yeah, that is too much of a good thing. Um, we don't have to be self-confident here. This is not about self-confidence. The fear of the Lord one has strong confidence. The confidence is in clinging to someone or something else for support or safety. And who that someone or something else is, is the Lord. So let's go to that one. The Lord. In Hebrew, I hate the English translations of these. Everywhere in the Bible where God's name is put, which is Yahweh, where that name is, nearly every English translation translates that as Lord. Um, there's a long history and tradition and reason for that. I think let's move on and let's get back to recognizing and calling God by who God calls himself and how God identified God's self. Yahweh. Yahweh is, is, means I am. I exist. I am what I am. Yahweh is a person, a personal God. Not a personal God in the sense of my own personal God. I have him just for me. But in the sense that God is not some vague, ambiguous, distant force like in Star Wars. Wars. Love Star Wars. God is not the force, and the force is not God. God is not, God has got a personality. God is a being, a person, the creator of the universe, the God of Abraham and the God of Moses, the God who called Moses out of a bush that never burned, a burning bush that never burned up, a God that said to Abraham, this wandering nomad with a, with a few people around him, your children will be beyond the stars of the sky, more in number. God of Rahab, the God of Deborah, the God of Ruth and Naomi, the God who is Jesus' father, the God who put on skin and bones and was born as Jesus into this world. This is the one in whom we can have our strong confidence. That's why we don't have to worry. We're not serving some petulant tyrant who will zap us for annoying him or cause us problems because, you know, we get a little to this or that. Our God loves us, created us, died for us, and has a plan for us with a future and a hope. That's who our confidence is in. But now let's get to the second half of this verse, which I think is striking and powerful and a word we need to hear today. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and their children will have a refuge. So get this. The one who fears the Lord will have strong confidence. And the children of that one will have a refuge. Everywhere else in the scripture we hear about God being refuge, it's a direct relationship. God is my refuge. The Lord is my refuge. The Lord is my fortress. God is my refuge. In this verse, when we as adults 
live in the fear of the Lord, our children have a refuge. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? Our children need a refuge. And, and let's be clear, our children, we're not talking about our biological children, not just our biological children. We gotta be this for our bi, this is a word for parents uh, and, 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 and as a way for us to be a blessing to our kids. If we live in the fear of the Lord, our biological children will have a refuge. But this is broader than that. To the children around us, the children in our communities, the children in our neighborhoods, the children in our, our culture and our country, the children in this world, as God's people, live in the fear of the Lord, the children will have a refuge. The children need a refuge. Do you know that since the pandemic started that middle school suicide rates are up dramatically? Did you know that? Did you know that since the pandemic started that middle school alcohol and drug abuse are up dramatically? Our children need a refuge. Our children need a refuge. How can we be that? Let's take a look at that passage from Luke. Ah, yeah, skip that. Take a look at that passage from Luke. Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. See, the context here, Jesus was out doing his Jesus thing. His mission was to save the world. That's a grown-up mission, right? I mean, that's serious. That's as big as it gets. And he's out, and he's preaching, and he's teaching. He's proclaiming the kingdom of God is here. It's at hand. He's telling folks, and he's showing folks the presence and the power of the kingdom of God. Sick people are getting well just by touching his cloak. People that are, have been plagued by demons and spiritual brokenness are being set free from all of that. The demons driven out. The dead have been raised to life. The poor have had good news announced to them, to them. Jesus is doing all of this. He's got an entourage following him around. Yay, Jesus, go, Jesus. They're surrounding him. The crowds are surrounding the entourage. In the middle of all of this grown-up stuff, these parents start bringing their little kids up to have Jesus touch them. And the disciples know Jesus doesn't have time for this. He's got more important things to do than deal with the kids. And so the disciples, his entourage, are sending the kids the parents away. Stop. They're rebuking them. What do you think you're doing? Bothering Jesus with your kids. And then Jesus stops the disciples. And he says, no. No. And I never noticed this. I've been, I'm 53 years old, and I've been in the church since I was born. And I've read, heard, and heard this passage read and taught over and over again. I've preached this passage. I never noticed this until I was preparing this sermon. Jesus called the children to him. He didn't even wait for the parents to bring him. He said, kids, come on. And the kid, I got to think they ran to Jesus, that he was surrounded by, you know, the, the, the parents were bringing the babies up. Jesus just called all the little children. Come on, I'm here for you. Come on. And then he said to his disciples, let the little children come. Do not hinder them. Don't just let them come. Make sure there's nothing in their way. Wow. Remove all the roadblocks. Mm -hmm. Remove everything that might get between them and me. Because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. The kingdom of God belongs to the little children. Let them come. And then Jesus said this. Truly I tell you, Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. There are two ways to interpret this legitimately based on the, uh, the grammar. Um, and, and the first way is the way that is most commonly taught and preached, which is receive the kingdom of God like a little child means receive the kingdom of God like a little child receives the kingdom of God with childlike faith trusting, accepting, without a ton of skepticism and that kind of stuff. It's a legitimate interpretation of this passage. The Gospel of Matthew and his gospel, the way he reports what Jesus said here, that's the only interpretation. But Luke and Mark, 
give another option for interpretation, and that's this. The grammar supports this, just as legitimate. Receive the kingdom of God like you receive a little child. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like you receive a little child will never enter into it. If, well, how do you receive a child? How do you receive a child with a lot of disruption? And now we're back. With a lot of disruption. Disruption comes in a lot of forms. My wife loves dogs. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, both of our dogs, very sadly, were quite old. They passed away last year. Um, and then my son, our son moved out of the house. Uh, and, and, and my mother-in-law moved out of the house. And it's just Amy and me. And Amy said, it's just you and me. I need a dog. <laughs> you can interpret that however you will. I've had dogs most of my life, never had a puppy before. Amy adopted a, uh, a, a puppy, uh, Panks, we call the puppy. I know this is going way back. If you can find Panks' picture in there, Chelsea, there's Panks. Yeah, he was cute then. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, Panks is 75% chocolate lab, 25% Aussie doodle, and 100% blah, he is nuts. Um, puppies are disruptive. You know, our whole life has had to be readjusted and shaped around this dog. Amy's more than mine because it's her puppy. Uh, but, you know, the peeing, the biting, the chewing, the barking, that you can't turn your back for a second, or the poor cat's being mauled, uh, it, you know, it's nuts. He's so disruptive. But you know what you can do with a dog? You can lock him in their kennel. You can't do that with a kid. <laughs> You can't do that. You shouldn't do that with a kid. <laughs> Children are disruptive. Children come into our lives, and they shake everything up. They cry when they want to cry. They, when they, when, when they want to eat, and it doesn't matter where you are. Really, you know, right? You know, you could be in worship, you can be at a funeral, you could be at a restaurant, and if the baby's going to cry, and I did this with my kids, shh, shh, no, they're not going, oh, I didn't understand, I'll wait till later. They just do it. They poo when they want to poo, they pee when they want to pee, they don't care how much the diaper holds, they're not holding back. And they stay that way for a long time. <laughs> Children are disruptive. And Jesus says, you have to receive the kingdom of God like you receive a child. Those children were disrupting the program for Jesus' disciples. They knew how things ought to be and how things should be. And the kids were disrupting all of that, all of the decorum, all of the seriousness, all of that. And Jesus said, yes, that's it. You see, all of this other stuff, you know, if you're not going to receive the kids, you're not going to receive the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to them. Receive the kids. Receive the kids. Our kids need a refuge. Our kids need more from us than outrage and celebration. They need more from us than wise sayings and condescending looks. They need more from us than just trying to squeeze them into our pre-programmed lives. The children need us to be disrupted so that they can have a refuge. Providing a refuge for children is worth the disruption. See, here's the thing. There's no escaping the disruption. Some of the disruptions are disruptions that are, are because of evil bubbling up and making its presence known in our lives, in our cultures, in our communities. Some of the disruption is God making God's presence known. 
in our lives, in our cultures, in our communities. And if our goal is to keep disruption at bay and simply have peace, then we might keep some of the evil out, but we will also keep the kingdom out. The promise of God is our refuge. It's not a promise of a life free of disruption. It's a promise that in the disruption, we have God for our strength and our confidence and our hope. And God is our refuge. It's not a promise to be free from the disruption. So as a church, we've made some decisions here recently to be more of a refuge for children. We've done a lot of that. We're gonna do even more. And, and it's God, we believe, really, really believe this is God's leading in this. You know, we do Kids Club out at our South Euclid campus on Wednesdays during the school year. Um, four hours a week this year, 1.30 to 5.30. That's a long time. Yeah. Pray for the volunteers for that. I, God bless them and I bless them. <laughs> Um, it's a long time. We've always done Kids Club through the school year and then broke during the summer. But Kids Club, you know, everything else in the church seems to, we're still struggling and recovering and regrowing since the pandemic started. We've come back face to face. Kids Club has been pandemic proof. It's the only thing I've encountered that's been pandemic proof. Uh, you know, by, we restarted Kids Club face-to-face -face in October of last year. By January, mid-January of last year, we had numbers exceeding our pre-pandemic numbers on a weekly basis. Yeah. And by the spring, we had nine kids requesting baptism. Nine kids out of Kids Club requesting baptism. You've seen the videos for some of those. Um, we haven't been able to baptize all of them yet. Um, we finished for the school year, and then we said, we can't just stop. And so we're restarting Kids Club on a limited basis this summer. We actually restarted this past Wednesday, going 4 to 6 rather than 1.30 to 5.30. Um, and, and, and then we're doing worship at the end of that. And... And, and that's been disruptive. Why has that been disruptive? Because to make time and space and room and that for our, and with, our, with our volunteers and our resources and our staffing, we have shifted Sunday morning face-to-face -face worship at South Euclid to Wednesday evening face-to-face -face worship at South Euclid. And we've changed the nature of that worship time, that it's no longer designed for adults. These are great worships we do. But we got, let's be honest, these are designed for adults. Kids are welcome here. They're always welcome here. If you've got kids in here, they're welcome here. If your baby starts crying, that's all right. That's cool. If your kid's fussing, that's all right. That's cool. We don't have a problem with that, but this worship is designed for adults. The Wednesday worship is designed for kids. You all are welcome. You're invited. You are invited, but don't try to make it like this, okay? And don't be disappointed if it's not like this. A lot more interactive, a lot more, you know, moving around, the kids up doing stuff, eating snacks, sometimes playing on their phones, and you think, well, they're not listening. That's true sometimes, but sometimes they are. And we started that this past Wednesday. Day and Jewel Huntley came in and he led worship and, and three seconds in he had the kids right there in the palm of his hand and they started clapping and they started singing along with him and he, I told him I said oh, we, you know we got, we're going to keep it short two songs so he did a mashup of a secular song and a song he wrote that the kids absolutely loved and he did a straight up worship song all on the same theme the theme of freedom and he finished that and I started in to, to talk and the kids said well we want more music and they were like well, yeah, come on and they wouldn't and I said Jewel can you stay and do another one he's like yeah so while he was working the other one I was talking with the kids all interactive up and down we took some video. We did a lot of things. Then Jewel did the final song, which he hadn't even prepared, and the kids got up, and they started dancing, and they went up on the stage, and they were dancing and worship and in praise. And no one asked them to. No one asked them to, but the, the voice of God was calling them, and nothing was getting in the way. They would never do that on Sunday morning. I could bring those same kids in here and have Jewel do the same music, and those kids would never do that we got the stuff out of the way that was hindering them so they could come. And then another little girl said, can I be baptized too? And she's young enough. I said, I got to talk to your mom. So I got to talk to her mom. And that was just one day. Let the children come. Don't hinder them. 
don't hinder them. The events like the Juneteenth celebration, so many kids coming, having a great time, having fun, sliding down the slide, playing basketball, eating food, getting face painted, just having a great time there with the adults. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And that's another area where God has been blessing out of our South Euclid campuses. These community meals, community events. Palm Sunday, we hosted a dinner at our South Euclid campus. And hear this, we've been averaging there. We were averaging maybe 25, 30 people on a Sunday morning since we got back from the pandemic. Depending, it may be a little more, maybe a little less, I don't know. Um, on Palm Sunday, when we did a community meal, we had over 350 people come in for that. Yeah. And, and don't tell me, but Pastor Scott, what about worship? How is this really the church? Jesus did most of his ministry, or at least a lot of his ministry, across the table, sitting down across the table. And he, folks, I'm going to preach at you for a second. Do you mind? I'm preaching it myself as well, but I'm going to preach at you. We got to get beyond evangelism as inviting someone to worship. Inviting people to worship is great. That's wonderful. But there's more to it than that. When folks say, well, how can you, if we invite people in for dinner and we don't have worship they can go to, how, how is that good? Invite them to your house. Invite them to coffee, invite them to lunch, get to know them, and you be Jesus in their life, and you breathe blessing into their life, and stop waiting for the church to do it on Sunday morning. Right? This is what Jesus said. If we're going to remove the barriers and the things that are hindering the children and the adults from coming to Jesus... Then we go to them, and we meet them where they are, and we bless them where they are, and we pray for them where they are, and we get to know them as people and build that relationship with them and with their kids or with them and with their parents. That's disruptive. It is. It's so much easier just to invite someone to come to church on Sunday where you're already coming there anyway, and I have to add another thing to my to-do list. But the kingdom of God is disruptive. And if we're going to serve the kingdom, if we're going to receive the kingdom, if we're going to enter the kingdom, if we're going to receive it, we've got to receive it like a child and allow our lives to be disrupted. So, band is in the wings. I'm two and a half minutes over. I apologize for that. But I got to say this. It's worth the disruption. Providing a shelter for the children is worth the disruption. Providing shelter and refuge for the adults in the community is worth the disruption. It's worth it in Jesus' name. Amen.